uh, Richard Sylvester is a humanistic psychologist, lecturer, and therapist. For many years, he engaged with a variety of sp spiritual experience practices, which also while also training its in psychotherapeutic techniques and teaching counseling. Since 2004, he has been writing and speaking about non-duality. He also has uh, written one of my favorite book, um, I Hope You Die Soon. Um, again, you know, the, with this, uh, we're going to do an interview first. And if Q&A happens, you can ask questions on the Q&A button there. I'm going to welcome Richard. He is coming on right now. Hi, Richard. Hi. How are you doing? Have I got to click on start my video? It's start like, your video, yes. There we go. Sorry, I didn't realize that was off. Hey. Good, good to see you again. Good to see you. I missed you. Uh, hello, it's still saying start my video. <laughs> oh, it's, it's okay now. Oh, now it's fine. Hey, yeah. Are we yeah. on? Yeah, 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 yeah. You were on. Yeah. Um, I said I missed you. I haven't seen you in a, in, in, in a, in a month or two. So, so has it been that long? <laughs> yeah, we had quite a few long conversations, didn't we? We did. <laughs> um, well, well, we can do an interview, but I know that there's people that want to ask questions as well. If they come around, well, would you like to answer them as well? Because yes, that's what's been... I'm in your hands. I'm, like, I'm expecting us to do whatever you want to do. And okay. Goes. Okay. Well, the first question, let me just pull up a question here, is... Um, Richard, what is the absolute truth? <laughs> <laughs> you know my style now. <laughs> okay, well, I'm just going to say to that that I think tr that, you know, the word truth is a, is a weasel word. <laughs> I hardly ever use it. I think, I mean, somebody might now be diving into my books and finding all sorts of places where I did use it. But it seems to me it's kind of a, a, a bit of a non-starter as a question. You know, because uh, <laughs> I'd rather deal with what is. I'll, I'll tell you my reluctance to go there. I think the you know, truth is it's conceptual. It's to do with the mind. It's a perfectly natural question to ask. It's not that it's, it's not that there's anything wrong with the question, but I feel like it's going to it'll it sends us down rabbit holes. That question. Let's go a little bit milder here. Let's go a little bit milder here. Um, you said that, you know, during a period of awakening in your uh, 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 book called A Hope You Die Soon, which is one of my favorites, the absolute fragility of the appearance is seen. Can you expand on that one? Uh, I can try to expand on it, but it's very difficult because one's trying to describe the indescribable. This is the problem with all of this stuff. But somehow, uh, let's say that probably in the kind of nor normal state, for a person living in separation, which means basically that the person feels that the world ex um, consists of two different things. One of them is themselves as separate from the world, and the other thing is the world through which they move. That's where you know our sense of duality comes from, if you like. And most of the time, if we're not on drugs or in some kind of psychotic state, everything seems pretty solid. Um, you know, pretty kind of real and solid. And all that I was trying to point to there is that there can be um, a, a period of time during the apparent life of this character when seeking is taking place. When uh, it, 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 there are no stages in this, but it almost can seem like a stage. And the way that we talk about it, in a way, has to make it seem like that, where everything just seems, that sense of solidity just kind of disappears and everything seems incredibly um, fragile, almost like it's kind of a projection on a gossamer screen or something like that. And I can kind of, you know, remember in my desperate searching times, um, periods of kind of wandering around, sitting around and wandering around, sort of peering at what seemed like this incredibly fragile world and feeling there was something just behind that screen that somehow I couldn't get and sort of desperate to see through that 
you know, it's, it's so frustrating because it seemed like almost, you know, all, like something painted on silk and it should be so easy to push aside and see what's beyond it and yet it's impossible for the person to do that. So I remember that time as a time of quite intense frustration. I really like that book, Confessions, that, that you wrote. Brilliant book. I, I laughed the whole way because it's, it's so um, relatable, you know, seeking and seeking. Can you share a little bit of your desperate seeking, Richard? <laughs> Oh, um, how long have we only got an hour? It's almost not worth <laughs> Just a summarized version of that desperate seeking. I have to say I very much enjoyed writing that book as well. It was wonderful to revisit those memories, you know, from now. But all I'll say, because we don't have a huge amount of time, is that, yes, from the age of about 30, um, <coughs> I was um, a very serious seeker. And um, I did all sorts of things. I went, my way of putting it is I went on all sorts of rides in the spiritual fun fair. Um, I was utterly devoted to a guru for some time. And I and the other devotees devoutly believed that this was not just a guru, but was the avatar of the new age. We kind of ignored the fact that at, the, at that time there were probably five or six other one and only avatars of the new age on the planet. But we kind of felt we had the one, ours was the real one. Um, all sorts of things. I flirted with probably about five or six different Buddhist groups. Um, many, <laughs> there were many, many rides in the spiritual fun fair. And um, I'd say um, I kind of got quite a lot from a lot of these rides, apart from just enjoyment in terms of what I would call personal development so kind of improvement on a kind of psychological and character level which at that time seemed very meaningful to me because i thought that i was on a path and if i made progress of a psychological kind i felt it was taking me further along that path so it was great fun it was a huge shock as well when i would use this phrase when um, non-duality bites <laughs> when non-duality bit me, it was a huge shock to realise that none of that really counted for anything. <laughs> Excuse me while I cough. <laughs> no worries, no worries. I'm, I'm going to squeeze a question here that just popped up on my screen. You okay? <laughs> you go ahead. I'll be back where I am. <laughs> Where does the wish to die come from? Does the wish reinforce the apparent seeker? <laughs> well, I say nothing can reinforce. The apparent seeker is just there until, until they're not there any longer. And nothing really makes any difference to that. Something's going to appear to make the sense of a person stronger or weaker, but that's just part of the story. And what was the first? That's the second part of the question. Delwood. What was the first part again? <laughs> Just a second. Uh, where does the wish to die come from? Does the wish reinforce the apparent seeker? Well, <laughs> the, I, I would say the wish to die comes from the kind of basically unsatisfactory nature of, of, of separation. You know, there, there seems to be a self, and because there seems to be a self, we seem to live in a state of separation. Going back to what I was saying before, there seems to be a world which is separate from me through which I move, separate from that world, and also separate from all the other persons who move in that world. And although at times this can seem very fulfilling and can bring a lot of joy and enjoyment and love and all sorts of positive experiences and negative experiences beyond both the positive and negative experiences i would say that there is a kind of for many of us a kind of creeping feeling of dissatisfaction um a kind of gnawing sense that not all is right that there is something maybe very subtle that is wrong that we can't put our finger on 
in a way, perhaps I could say we can only really put our finger on what it is that's wrong when it's no longer there, all right? So, so what, what, what appears is that I seem to be irrevocably separate from all my experiences, even the most fulfilling, all my loved ones, even the most fulfilling, but I can't realize that. I can't realize that that is what the problem is until my sense of self has disappeared. When my sense of self is dis has disappeared, and so there is no longer any separation, it's like that's when separation can be recognized in retrospect. It's like that sense of relief. Ah, so that's what was wrong for those 30, 40, 50, 60 years. And, and also absolutely revelatory, not just, ah, oh, so that's what was wrong, but ah, oh, now there's the understanding of why I could never realize that. If uh, one way of putting this is the understanding suddenly comes that I could never solve the problem of being me. Brilliant. There's a comment here. Richard, you are far the funniest non-duality teacher. <laughs> oh. I know. Kind of fair. Recently, maybe because of a sort of madness affecting me from the COVID lockdown, I have vaguely contemplated going into stand-up comedy. So <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> that book is really hilarious. <laughs> that book. <laughs> Um, th there's another question here. Um, is the past and future all in the now? It's the past and future. There is only the now. There is only the now. So what of the past and future is there in the now is whatever arises in consciousness. That's all. So if a thought about um, what I had for lunch yesterday arises in the now, then the past is in the now. Um, I'm very much hoping after we've had this lovely conversation, I'm very much hoping to go out for an Indian meal with my partner. So that is in, you know, the Indian meal that I'm hoping to have in a couple of hours time is in the future. That's all. There is only, I mean, in a way, even there is only the now is misleading. There is only this. There is, let's get rid of the time words completely. Let's throw the now um into the uh, waste bin as well because it's misleading much clearer it's much clearer if we just say what there is is simply this it's simply what's happening now this is the only reality there is no other reality than what is happening right now but what's happening right now includes of course the possibility of thoughts and feelings about an apparent past and thoughts and feelings about an apparent future. So in that sense, we could say the past and future are only in this. If we want to say they're only now, that's fine, but it's clearer to say there is only what's actually happening. I feel also, I'll just throw in at this point, uh, the thing I usually say at this point, which I think, you know, to say that, to say, in fact, what we're saying is there is no past and future. Actually, I'm saying there isn't a present either. There is just this. But in one sense, that's extremely challenging for the mind. In another sense, it's absolutely obvious. It's what I call, it's in the realm of the bleeding obvious. But there is just this. Nothing else exists. Bam. Bam. <laughs> Bam. Um, I'll leave you to guess whether what I've got in this bottle, whether it's gin. water, gin, vodka. Gin, I knew it, gin. <laughs> I can't do that because by the time seven o'clock hits, like five hours later, I'll be like slurring. Why? Be. <laughs> Dude, you've been at this for hours now, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. I hope it's gone well anyway. <laughs> um, is the biting of non-duality a matter of pure chance? That's from Anz. I'd love to say yes to that. Um, 
this could this could sound a bit frustrating um the mind absolutely wants to tell so i mean it needs to it has to tell stories about how the world works in all sorts of different ways right and even when we come to something like non-duality the mind cannot help telling stories and uh part of the way it does that is to ask itself questions about different possibilities so some of those possibilities might be um, you know, if non-duality bites or you know, if we use the uh, well-known metaphor, you know, if the tiger seizes your head in its mouth, is that a matter of chance? Is it a matter of destiny? Is it because God wills it? Is it because of my amazingly positive karma or my amazingly negative karma, maybe? Is it because of my many previous lifetimes as a sincere seeker and bodhisattva? And on and on and on. The, the mind can make up endless questions about this, looking for an answer so that it can, you know, create this story and concretize it. And OK, now I understand what's going on. None of this applies. None of this applies. So is non-duality biting a chance event? No. Is it then a predestined event? No. Is it because of my glorious karma? No. You know, any story is just a story. This is one of the most frustrating things about this. I mean, while, I mean, I mean at its core, one of the most frustrating things about non-duality is the mind's inability to get to grip with it. And, it, and the mind's insistence that if I, it only asks maybe one more question or maybe a hundred or a thousand more questions, then it will finally understand it. Oh, and by the way, I suppose after the thousandth question, the mind might finally understand non-duality, and that means nothing whatsoever. Understanding has absolutely no bearing here at all. Non-duality may be seen, I mean, that is not a good phrase, but we'll I'll stick with it for now. Non-duality may be seen, and there may be no understanding whatsoever or non-duality could at least in theory be understood down to its last iota and that means nothing at all it's just it would just be concepts concepts have no bearing here whatsoever <coughs> richard since you're the funniest guy in anduality can you share me a joke <laughs> is that a question that's just come in <laughs> it's just it's just from me <laughs> This is, I've been asking Tony to tell me a joke, so maybe he's watching right now and he can beat that joke. <laughs> I think the answer to that is going to be no. Um, the joke, whenever anybody says that, you know, there is a certain joke that immediately floods into my mind, but two problems with it. I think it's the funniest joke I've ever heard. Two problems with it. One is extremely long and the other is it's very obscene. So I think I'm, all I'm going to say is it involves a rabbit and I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no worries, no worries. I better get to some of the questions that are good here oh, because my questions are ridiculous. Um, ben goes, what was your present process or investigation? What were the questions that and roots that helped break the illusion? Thanks. The questions and the truths. Okay, first of all, let's deal with the second bit. I've already dealt with that. Truth has no bearing here. I mean, you know, truths are... Yeah, intellectual concepts so I, I have no interest in them and they have no relevance to this and the first part of the question was what are the what were the process or investigation That's, what was your process or investigation it's irrelevant it, it doesn't matter it, it, it has no bearing again this is a, a very I mean I might sound as if I'm being unnecessarily dismissive I'm, I'm not you know um, it, these are very very natural questions they're almost inevitable questions for the mind to ask and it's part of the shock of seeing non-duality is the recognition that they have no bearing so the process you know process goes on there's just this and in this all sorts of processes arise and some of these processes could appear to have a bearing on a spiritual path or on seeking or on psychological understanding but it, in the end it's all irrelevant you know it's just mind stuff you know the mind says okay 
I spent five of the last 10 years sitting in the Himalayas at the foot of the Guru, eating rice and dal and getting diarrhea. I must be getting that closer to this. And then if this is seen, the mind may well latch onto that and say, it's because of all those bouts of diarrhea and the suffering that I went through because of that, that um, I have somehow, now I have got it. Believe me, nobody gets it, but maybe the mind might say that. But it, it's just a, it's just the sweet old story of the mind. So process is what inevitably seems to unfold. And it has nothing to do with us. And it has no relevance. I want you to share that story about, you know, uh, the, 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 the guru. Which one? <laughs> part of it. Too long. I mean, my guru, the guru. Is, yes. It's far too long to share. That's right. That's right. I'm going to go to the question. Sorry. Sorry. Just, it's just, a, yeah, I, I just really enjoyed that, that, that story. If you guys want to hear that story, there's a book called Confessions of a Seeker, which is Richard's funniest book. If you guys like non-duality comedy. Uh, David asked, can you talk about long drawn protracted, protracted liberation versus a sudden re- liberation phase? Surely the me is either there or it isn't. So how would it be possible for the me to fade out over time? Um, I have no idea. I've never, I've never used the phrase long drawn out protected, protracted liberation. I probably will never use it again other than just to repeat it now. I have no idea what it means. <laughs> I can't even pronounce it. <laughs> no, I, 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 I can't comment on that phrase. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Well, I mean, you... even, even to talk about the self being there or not being there, I mean, even that's misleading, but we're back to this thing that we have to use words. So we just try and find the words that for each of us seem, you know, maybe the closest whilst recognizing that they're still a long way away. All right. There's one is from no one. While you, <laughs> while you were a seeker, Richard, did you feel the need to share, help other seekers? How has this changed to, that, to what you don't do now? Do you feel a compassion to help? No. Um, the, the, the answer to the first of the question is yes, very definitely. Yes, I, I, I mean, you know, part of my seeking process, as it was for many people, was feeling that I was getting somewhere, I was getting wiser, I was accumulating, I don't know, spiritual merit. I, I wouldn't have put it in such a pompous way back then, but absolutely. So quite early on, I became a meditation teacher for my beloved guru who then went on to disgrace himself. And after he disgraced himself and I abandoned him, I went on teaching meditation for many years after that. I got involved with kind of transpersonal psychotherapy processes. I was a, you know, I was a kind of teacher of adults. I ran workshops. Um, Yes, absolutely. I was very, very um, committed um, to helping people, definitely. Yeah, and there was a second bit to that question. Second bit to that question, just a second, is um, uh, how has this changed to what you do now? It's disappeared. Very simple. It's just gone. Do you feel a compassion to help? No, absolutely not. No, no, I feel no, uh, I mean, whatever, you know, I feel no impulse to help whatsoever, whether it's from compassion or anything else. You know, I mean, I just kind of do stuff. And I mean, maybe sometimes people find that helpful or, or not. Or maybe I'll, I will become a stand-up comic and they'll find it amusing or not. I don't know. No, no, no. There's, no, there's absolutely no intention to um, help people here, particularly not around. I mean, I don't mean like, you know, if, I, if a friend was struggling with their shopping, I might well help them with their shopping. But I assume we're talking simply about non-duality here. Um, there's no impulse to help. And uh, I would actually feel a certain degree of suspicion of anyone who was attempting to help through non-duality, because I, I don't think it's, it's possible. And I think one of the things I, I've noticed, and I can sort of throw this in now, I, I'm not, I haven't thought this out very clearly, but it came to me the other day. It seems to me there's kind of like three 
what I'm going to call three forces in non-duality at the moment, or three trends. Um, one is um, um, the kind of, we can approach non-duality from a way which is sort of psychotherapeutically helpful, um, which may well be the case, you know, that um, people still have problems and uh, all sorts of ways they might be available, including therapeutic ways of helping people with their problems around that. Um, one is that we can use, I think, I, th I think this is, this is probably one third, one third or one third. So I think you know, about a third of the stuff that I come across falls into the second category, which is that we can use non-duality to usher in a wonderful new age of enlightenment. And it's our duty to go out there and to spread the world of non-duality like the gospel. I think this is a, um, a very sweet story. It's a very attractive story. I think it's also utter, utter nonsense. Um, I seem to be in a mood not to kind of uh, be mealy mouthed about my words at the moment, but that, you know, that's my honest kind of reaction to that. But it's a lovely story. It's a very attractive story. And then there's just like, well, an impact, you know, there's non, there, there's kind of, there's non-duality, it's a bit of a ridiculous phrase, but whatever the hell it is that we are trying to communicate here, just an impulse comes up to communicate about it in some people and an impulse in some apparent people and an impulse comes up to listen to that communication and to ask questions about it and to engage with it in other people. It's a mystery why that happens, but then everything's a mystery. But the, you see, the mind, um, uh, Tony's on after me, I notice, on your programme. And one of the things that Tony often says is that the mind's a businessman or a businesswoman. You know, the mind is always looking for a profit. The mind is always looking for, OK, this commodity has come along. Now, how can I use it? So that's what, that's what some minds are doing with non-duality. Now, non-duality has come along. Here's another, here's another commodity. Now, how can I turn that into a profit? Oh, I know. I can save the world with it. But all I can say is good luck with that. Let me know how it pans out. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there is an understanding that there is no person here in my experience. This is from an anonymous. But there is not an understanding of oneness with others. How can I reconcile that? Okay, I'm a bit tripped up there by the word understanding because without being able to have a two-way conversation, you see, my immediate um, response, the simplest response to, to this would be to say, well, this has nothing to do with understanding. You know, there can be, um, you know, a great deal of understanding of what we're talking about, but it has no, it's just, it, you know, it's just a kind of an intellectual story. So it doesn't really have any bearing on what we're talking about. But if I kind of interpret that in a different way and say, okay, may, you know, perhaps they're, you know, talking about, a, you know, something, I'm going to use the phrase deeper than understanding, though that's not a very good phrase. Just say the question again. There's an understanding of, there is, Oh, I just, there is an understanding that there is no person here yeah. in my experience, but there's not an understanding of oneness with others. How can I reconcile that? Okay. Well, to me, again, you see, I, I'd say this has nothing to do with an, with a, with a, an understanding, even, even using that word in the widest, most generous sense you know, of oneness with others. This is not about feeling or sensing or being at one with others. To me, that is an experience. Uh, it involves probably emotionality and so forth. Feeling oneness with others is wonderful. Uh, it's great if it happens. I, I, I sometimes feel oneness with others. Sometimes I feel more oneness with others. Sometimes less oneness with others, particularly if they cut me up in my car. Uh, but that has nothing to do with what we're talking about because that is all in the realm of experience. And that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is what goes, you know, if you like, what goes 
beyond experience or what underlies experience. It also embraces experience, you know, but to me, that phrase, it's, you know, it, 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 it might be about a certain emotional experience. It might be about certain ideas of goodness or a desirable way to be in the world and to experience others. It would be wonderful to experience more love for others, of course. All of that's great, but it's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the ground level here, what underlies all of that. Questions are pouring in, Richard, so I'm just going to ask some of them. I know we're supposed to have an interview, but, you know, in our interviews, half of it goes to the cutting floor. <laughs> oh, I, I, oh, Emerson, I thought in our interviews, about 90% of it went <laughs> All the bits about conspiracy theories and all. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Didn't even said that. I know. I, I know. <laughs> so this is good that people are asking questions because <laughs> let's not talk about that anymore. That's right. That's right. I know. I know. I know. I'm going to ask these safe questions. Uh, anonymous question: We are living in a dream life, but some of us are living in an easier dream than others. Is this random? Well, again, firstly, I wouldn't say that we are living in a dream life. Um, that wouldn't be my way of putting it. But uh, ignoring that, we're back to the question that, that was already asked. We don't really need to deal with this one at length any, a, anymore. The, the mind, of course, insists on finding a story. And the mind is particularly attracted, for I think fairly obvious reasons, to stories uh, which um, involve and imply justice, you know, things working out fairly. We have a very, very powerful evolutionary desire for fairness and justice, and we hate injustice. Um, so um, the mind looks for a story um, to explain whatever. One of those stories is, is everything random. Uh, it's a kind of satisfactory story from the point of view that it gives an answer, but it's an unsatisfactory story because it confronts our, our desire for justice and fairness, you know, because if everything's random, that's unfair. All I can say is forget about all of that. You know, this isn't random. It's not intended. It's not destiny. It's none of that, you know, because, you know, how do we explain that? I'm sorry, all I can go back, and I know how paradoxical this, this sounds, is all I can do is go back to the essence and say, because nothing's actually happening. Now, if we want to talk about fairness and justice and social justice and society and politics and endless, 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 I mean, we're not going to do it here but we could do it. And believe me, as a character, I'm very interested in all of that stuff, but that ain't what we're here for. All right, from the, I, I think I've kind of flipped back into a sort of transcendental meditation state from about 30 or 40 years ago, because I think this is one of their phrases. It sounds very pompous, from the ground state, from the ground of all being, whatever. You know, we, we, it's, it, it, this just becomes irrelevant, you know. It's not random. It's not planned. Oh, how can that be? Because nothing's actually happening. Now, as soon as the mind comes in there with a story, then it's a different matter. This one is, this one is uh, another question from Victor. If what happened to you is complete happenstance, if so, what in the world are we doing here? <laughs> well, firstly, it's not complete happenstance. That's another story. It, happenstance is just another word for random or chance. So it's not random. It's not not random. It's not chance. It's not not chance. You know, I'm sorry. I know how frustrating this seems. But, you know, the temptation, you know, here, the temptation to kind of launch into a story of meaning for this, the personality is quite strong. But I'm not going to go there. Um, so that's the first part. And the second part, one of the things, by the way, that you can probably tell, because I keep asking you to repeat the second part of, um, the question is that, I mean, one of the things I think many people who talk about non-duality say and notice is this totally buggers your memory. 
Yep. So, <laughs> yeah. What was the second part? Uh, if so, what in the world are we doing here? Well, we're not here. I feel like <laughs> we, you know, we are not here. So the question collapses. I mean, I would like, I'd just throw in, I mean, I don't know if I'll ever work this up into my, uh, the stand-up comedy app that I'll probably never do, but I did hear somebody quite, I don't know who it was, said this, they were quoted on the radio a few weeks ago. I thought it was lovely. He said, um, uh, I understand that I'm here to help other people, but what I can't understand is what the other people are here for. And I think that opens up a profoundly, uh, a profoundly deep philosophical space to explore. You know, it's an obvious question for the mind or the ego to ask, what the hell are we doing here? And out of that question arise all the myriad religions, all the spiritual stories, all the philosophical stories, you know, literally thousands of religions all trying to answer that question, what am I doing here? Or a little bit more forcefully when we get desperate, what the hell am I doing here? Oh, I'm here to please God, or I'm here to kill heathens so that God will be pleased, or I'm here to fulfill my dharma or, or whatever. You know, these are all perfectly lovely stories. Well, no, some of them aren't so lovely, actually, the ones that involve killing other people. Um, that's the sweet old nature of the mind, right? What can I give as an answer that sat well, certainly no answer that's satisfactory. All I can say is the question collapses because we aren't here. This is simply what's happening. Bam. Um, <laughs> Art goes, you have a lot of books behind you, Richard. Did any of those books help you get to see this leading obvious just this do you have any favorite books on this or in general um well firstly the middle part of that question uh, no absolutely not no book helped me to see this no book you know i didn't see this no book can help anyone to see this no one will ever see this yet this can be seen weasel word so let's really spell it out okay can the fact that this can be seen by no one be aided by books? Well, no, nothing's relevant to this. It doesn't matter. You know, books will be read or they won't be read. And we think that it has something to do with us. We think we make choices about that. The revelation, if you like, of, of, of seeing what we're talking about is that there is no one to make those choices. And then the third part was any... Uh any specific book? Did any of these books help you get to see this bleeding obvious? No, I've dealt with that. Uh, just this. Do you have any favorite books on this or in general? Um, I don't think I do have any favorite books on this. I mean, obviously, I have to say, yes, my own, yes. Um, but no, <laughs> really. And uh, I, don't, I mean, the other part of it is too big a question. You start getting me talking about my favourite books, that will take up the rest of the time we've got. So nothing springs immediately to my mind. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. I don't know whether any of those titles are visible for people, but if, I, <laughs> if they want to. Sorry. I'm trying to read it, Richard, but I can't. I, uh, I, have, yeah, I will give a plug. I shouldn't give a plug for somebody else. You, yeah, 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 yeah. Just reread. I don't know why. I just felt an impulse to reread Mick Brown's book, uh, The Spiritual Tourist. And I enjoyed that very much. So there you go. Awesome. How can I stop believing these stories? These seem to be an obstacle. This is Tim's question. Well, you. <coughs> You can't stop believing in stories. Belief in stories will go on until they stop. However, they're not an obstacle because nothing's an obstacle. If things were obstacles, we could work at clearing those obstacles out of the way. And when we cleared the last of those obstacles out of the way, Eureka, that would be it. So, you know, then we're, then we're on a, a part we, we, then we're endorsing, if you like, a path of purpose. And the path is, I mean, in a way, this is at the heart of 
belief probably in all or most paths if not all paths no not all paths but most paths you know that paths consist of taking us through the obstacles and clearing them out of the way it's a lovely story um forget it Greetings, Richard. This is from Adrian. Some teachers suggest ways to explore in the presence, like self inquiries, etc. Do you propose any way to explore the self? Thank you. Long pause to take a drip, drink before saying no. Uh, what I would say about any kind of um, any kind of practice, I just, I, just for simplicity's sake, because we don't have a huge amount of time, is that I would, um, let, let's kind of put it all together, whether it's a um, kind of uh, spiritual practice or psychotherapeutic practice or any kind of practice at all. I just lump it all together, you know, as kind of, you know, some things that we do can be therapeutic as in they can be good for us they can be good for the person they can help to relieve some of the pain that the person feels and some of the problems that the person goes through so i sort of you know put all of this together and say something which again is kind of in the realm of the bleeding obvious that you know if we come across some practice um whatever it may be and it seems to relieve or let's say it actually does relieve some of our suffering as a person uh, or leads to kind of greater understanding of myself as a person or it's enjoyable as some practices can be well great you know that's absolutely great do it you know you know do it I'm, I'm i'm saying that as if there is a person who can choose to do it you know we can we could cut all of this out by reminding ourselves that there isn't but let's stay with this story for a little while because there is you know so much of the i mean i think a lot of the non-duality world as it were the world of speakers and listeners is kind of obsessed with this question of practice or not practice to me it's just you know very very simple you know i mean forget about practice as far as this is concerned but if practice is helpful or if practice is enjoyable then do it you know i could list a good few practices i've done in my time that i found helpful or enjoyable or both for me self-inquiry was absolutely and definitely not one of them um, so I wouldn't go there, but other people say it's helpful or whatever, whatever, whatever. Fine. Great. Wonderful. But it's essentially irrelevant to what we're talking about. But we don't have to get, as we say in England, probably not a Canadian or American phrase. We don't have to get our knickers in a twist about it. And, you know, the, it does generate a lot of, you know, not much light, but a great deal of heat, this kind of question, uh, this sort of question of things like, you know, self-inquiry and so forth. If you enjoy it, do it. And if you feel that it's kind of helpful to our level of comfort as an individual, as a person, do it. Great. Wonderful. Here's, not, an here's another one, Richard. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> if you enjoy it do it great if not not don't beat your head don't kind of you know buy into some sort of in, you know mind story that self-inquiry is good for you and then beat your head against it for the next three years even though it's torture richard the the pathless path how do you walk it <laughs> the pathless path how do you walk it <laughs> well again you don't walk it you don't walk it. You know, there may be um, an appear, an illusion is a diff dodgy word. There may be an appearance of a person, an individual who walks a path, like a path of meditation or a path of a bhakti path, perhaps a, a path of devotion to the guru and, you know, chanting bhajans, which is, might be a lovely thing to do. So or all sorts of paths, obviously. Um, there might, might be that appearance. Once the um, mind has got hold of a sufficiently sophisticated story, 
and feels the mind then feels that it is no longer naive you know the mind feels oh i have now graduated from you know junior school to high school then it might get the idea of walking a pathless path which sounds you know far more zen like <laughs> you know than uh, just a path again it's just a it's just a lovely story so you know while there's a sense of a person walk the pathless path in whatever way you want to there may be the recognition that there never was a path whether it was a paved path or a pathless path and there never was anyone who walked it richard you were you were a psychologist before right a lecturer a therapist yeah i was yeah, trained before that. Yeah, I, I, I did quite a lot of stuff but yeah i was trained as a humanistic psychologist yeah so there's a question here from from sid friedman i just wanted to give you that, that background sid is can i'm confused by embodiment my experience i'm confused by embodiment my experience is being embodied in as consciousness presence awareness can you speak uh, importance of body embodiment and the prevention of part of personality utilizing awakening for spiritual bypass i know that's a long question I i'm going to repeat yeah i'm confused by embodiment my experience is being embodied in consciousness, presence, awareness. Can you speak the importance of body embodiment and the prevention of a part of personality utilizing awakening for a spiritual bypass or a spiritual bypassing? Yeah, probably not. I probably can't speak to that or well, not for very long. Um, I don't like the phrase spiritual bypass. I know it's very popular in certain quarters. Um, <laughs> I think it's a bit up itself, to be honest, you know, <laughs> you know, some of us didn't do the spiritual bypass. So we're integrated and others did do the spiritual, you know, we're stuck on the spiritual bypass and need help. So I don't like that phrase. However, when it comes to, and I'm, I'm not comfortable talking about the word embodiment because I'm not quite clear about what's meant by that in the question, but when it comes to, um, you know, integration, uh, yeah, I think that's very simple. I think that, um, you know, this may be seen, and when this is seen, life goes on, and the nature of that life might be of any kind, and it might be, might involve all sorts of, uh, let's, in air quotation, say, problems still, um, and the individual may feel the need to work on or deal with those problems and uh, that may be called integration uh, this is all perfectly valid and I have nothing very much to say about that in the time that we've got other than you know I would say perhaps it's a sort of fairly obvious thing to some uh, people but it's not so obvious to others but if there's been any kind of awakening um, it might be very helpful to see someone, whether they're a psychologist, a psychotherapist, a, a teacher, or a speaker, whatever. It might be, might be very helpful. Might not be, but it might be very helpful. But my, um, the, the one thing I would say is that if there's been any kind of awakening, it's far, far better to share that with someone and to see someone who knows that i was going to say who understands that but more than understands it who actually knows it because otherwise you could get into all sorts of difficulty and i mean i've talked to people who have shared maybe they've already let's say had a history of seeing a particular psychotherapist and there's been a, an aware and they've got on very well with that psychotherapist maybe they felt that that person's been very helpful to them up to a point and there's been an awakening and then they've shared that with the psychotherapist and they very very strongly regretted that afterwards and it in some cases brings the psychotherapeutic relationship to an end so i would say don't talk about this to well, i mean even a friend because i mean apart from this would probably just frustrate them but I would say, you know, I don't usually give advice and this sounds pretty much like advice, but I would just say, you know, be careful who you share this with. If there's been an awakening, you know, don't talk to a psychologist or a psychotherapist or a priest, well, particularly not a priest, you know, or anyone in a helping role, unless you've pretty much got the sense that, you know, they know what this is about. 
and I do mean know it, I don't mean understand it. I mean, understanding might be sufficient, but it's better if they know it. So, I mean, um, somebody asked me years ago whether I thought I'd ever see a psychotherapist again. Oh, I don't know, I don't know what's gonna happen in the future, but I did say, you know, it's, it's unlikely, but if I did ever go to a psychotherapist again as a client, I would want it to be a psychotherapist who wasn't there. Meaning, you know, where this was known, this was seen, because otherwise I wouldn't feel safe about sharing those, you know, all of that, because the problem is where this hasn't been, this isn't recognized, isn't known or whatever, there is a temptation and a tendency to um, pathologize it. So to see awakening as, uh, as a kind of pathology to confuse it, for example, I mean, the most obvious thing is, for example, to confuse it with dissociation. So that's all I'd say to that, I'd say, just be a bit cautious about you know, check them out before sharing with them. Thank you. Uh, anonymous question is non duality just, just another story? Oh, yeah, of course it is. Yeah, of course, it's, it's just another story. Everything in words is just a story. Um, I mean, again, my second reference to the fact that, you know, Tony's on after me. Tony might well say, you know, something about the word non duality itself. You know, I mean, it's, a, it's a kind of it's a nonsense word. Um, on, on that level, yeah, everything, everything I'm saying is nonsense. Everything everybody else is saying about it is nonsense. Yeah, it's just another story. However, I, I, I will put in a but. Uh, uh, however here, you know, uh, my claim would be that it is the mother of all stories because it's the one with the least unnecessary complexity. So, you know, if you look at you know, the vast array of stories, mostly of meaning and purpose. I mean, non-duality, if you like, is a story of meaningless and purposelessness. But, you know, most stories are stories of meaning. But if you look at those, the ones the mind does, I mean, they're immensely complicated. I mean, just look at the story of Roman Catholicism, for example, you know, or Tibetan Buddhism. I mean, I mean, in some ways, lovely stories, very ornate and ornamental and lots of decorations and very beautiful in some ways, although not in others. Um, but full of complexity and curlicues because that is what the mind likes. So I would say, yes, of course, non-duality is just another story, but it's the mother of all stories. It is the, it is the most, it is the one that is freest of um, unnecessary ornamentation, let's say. And I just remembered a quotation I love very much and I can never remember who this is from. Uh, there is something of the breath of freedom blowing through Advaita. And I love that quotation and I think it is absolutely true. Even just a kind of an intellectual contact with this, if there's an openness even to that, there can be a sense of that breath of freedom. And partly what that freedom uh, consists of is that it's throwing all of this rather glorious decorative superstitious crap out of the window because all of that you know that complexity you know you think of the complexity of um, you know Roman Catholicism etc 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 it's a prison you know it's a wonderfully beautiful comfortable Sometimes, not other times, you know, at, at prison. And the simplicity of Advaita is freedom from that. If you like, freedom from belief, freedom from superstitious belief. Thank you. There's a question here from Fritz. Some teachers say enlightenment is binary. Binary? Either you are awake or you are not. What is your pers perspective on that? Well, no, you're not awake or asleep because there is no you. <laughs> does that dispose of, does that deal with that one satisfactorily? <laughs> yeah. um, there's another question here. This time is flying, huh? Wow, we have like eight minutes left. Mind you, uh, you've got to go on to another... Um, <laughs> you've got to go on to a... Um, 
with curry, hopefully. That's right. I've been eating cinnamon. Here in I've been eating cinnamon rolls in between, just kind of like you know, scarfing down stuff. Uh, I'm full of sugar now. Um, <laughs> there is a deep interest in non-duality. That's what's happening, and there is a wish to disappear. But the apparent separation did not collapse. The question is why the apparent ap ap uh, separation did not collapse. That's a question from an anonymous person. Yeah, and um, very, I mean, this is, I mean, I think this is a very common experience, I'll call it. And one of the problems is that, you know, it, it's the problem with any why question, that it, it can only be answered with a, 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 a rationale from the mind. Um, it's perfectly natural for the mind to want to know this. Why or why not? Why does this happen? Why has this happened to Fred, but it hasn't happened to me? Of course, it didn't happen to Fred, and it never will happen to you. But that's not a satisfactory answer to the mind. So the mind wants to know why. Okay, I could sit here and I could give you 12 different answers to that question in rapid succession. Uh, at least some of which would probably sound convincing for at least four minutes and they'd all be nonsense because they'd all just come from the mind. The fact is that what's happening is what's happening. And part of that is whatever experience there is. And that's the experience. And that's what the mind says and that's what the mind asks and it's quite natural for that to happen. And there can be, and it can seem like a process, although there are no processes, there can be a kind of collapsing of the mind where these questions just die away. Not because there are, I mean, th th this is one of the, I think this is one of the core things I often say about asking questions about this. You know, it's hopeless, it's, it's absolutely futile. I mean, what we're doing over these two days is completely futile you know, asking and answering questions about this, but there can be what can appear to be a process unfolding in time, whereby the mind just begins to give up with these questions, not because they're answered, but because the mind begins to get that they cannot be answered and will not be answered satisfactorily. This one is from Michael. Was the shift in perspective preceded by a personal catharsis? Um, not in any meaningful sense. I mean, I was very involved with um, what I would call um, uh, cathartic uh, techniques for personal growth and for therapeutic exploration. So I did a lot, I spent a lot of time in my 30s and 40s probably catharting like hell, you know, beating people to death on a pillow with a tennis racket and that sort of thing, expressing my anger, all of that sort of thing. That was very, very wildly popular in those days. I had nothing to do with this. So if you like, in the story of Richard, that preceded this in time, but not in any sense in a meaningful way. In other words, that did not lead to whatever apparently happened after that in the story of time. This is a follow-up question from David. Uh, apologies for the clumsy phraseology earlier, earlier with protracted liberation. Do you remember that question in the beginning? I forgot, I have a very cool <laughs> I forgot about it too. <laughs> Let me try again. Are there, are there many accounts of the sense of separation slowly fading away? Are there many accounts of the sense of separation slowly fading away rather than a sudden apparent event occurring? It feels... Uh, here as though uh, the belief in my story is becoming less important. Yeah, um, I don't know if there are many accounts, firstly, because I don't know here what we would define as many, but certainly there are such accounts. Yes, absolutely. There, there are accounts um, like that. I think also, I'll just throw this in as well, I think there are also um, accounts where the sense of separation never really fully formed in the first place. So there was never, if you like, a kind of, let's say, a falling away of the person, either suddenly or, or not so suddenly, because the sense of personhood didn't really form. Last couple of questions here, because we're almost time, and I don't know which to pick. Um, 
how did you get to your state <laughs> or uncover your ignorance? How did you get to your state or uncover your ignorance? Well, that's, that's, that's easy to deal with. I didn't get to, I am not in a state. You know, everything is constantly in flux. So I am not in a state because if I was in a state, how long would that last in the story of time? I don't know, a microsecond before I'm in a different state. I am not in a state. Uh, and I did not uncover my ignorance. You know, there was simply at some point, I'm going to use this word realization, although it's not a good word. There was simply the realization by no one, not by me, you know, that the I doesn't exist, that the self doesn't exist. So um, if you want to call the belief that there is an I ignorance, I did not uncover that ignorance and no I, no ego state can uncover that ignorance and yet that ignorance can simply disappear, let's say. Well, thank you so much, Richard. Um, we're going to... Uh, yeah, that, that was that was epic. Um, I have a whole bunch of, I prepared an interview with you because I thought we we're going to do an interview, but all of these questions started popping up and, and um, but we'll do another one and it's going to be most likely in the cutting floor anyway. The, the That's great. Yeah. <laughs> we, will, we will do another interview and like all the others, we'll end up <laughs> I know. maybe if we don't mention uh, shapes of the wizards, it'll be all right. <laughs> I was editing it one night, I'm like, oh no. <laughs> it's just so much fun instead of putting it on the on the cutting room floor you should issue put the whole thing on 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 youtube but you should cut the sound on the difficult parts and put the kind of oblong black square <laughs> over my mouth to indicate where it's been censored just like a little horn <laughs> yeah. it'll be 90 percent of that though that will that will be funny Anyway, oh. if we do another interview, I will, I'm sure I'll enjoy it, whether it's <laughs> yeah. anyone else or not. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we are going to close the webinar now. Uh, please go back to the event homepage about 15 minutes and you can sign back in. Tony Parsons is next. Uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and uh, Richard, can you, can you honor us by giving us a, a, a death wish, the audience a death wish? Yes, to each and every one of you. I think I'm going to say if you want to, I'm not going to say whether you want to or not, but to each and every one of you, I hope you die soon. <laughs> Thank you. you. You know that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I didn't, but I could again. Oh, okay. So. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll see you back in about 15 minutes uh, with Tony Parsons. Take care. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.